believe the, the next item of business is the business of the Academic Student and External Affairs Committee. Uh, in the absence of Curator Stewart, I've asked Curator Covington to lead the discussion if she can find her way to her seat. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was actually conducting a little bit of official business oh. with Curator Phillips on okay. the side, and I That's apologize for being late and being seated. <laughs> All right, we're going to ask Vice President Foley to come up to make presentations in this section of the, of the meeting. Curator Covington, thank you. Uh, what I'll be talking about in the next 10 or so minutes is uh, financial aid and how financial aid is put together, what our students are doing, what it looks like. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. LaShonda Carter-Boone, who's here in the audience, and also Mr. Randy Sade, who's also in the audience. Both of them are work with our instructional research group institutional research group, I should have said. And uh, they're the ones who really curate this data and keep track of it and let us know what's going on. And when we see a bump or a change, uh, they alert us. I'm happy to say there haven't any bumps or changes. I think you'll see that as we go through this today. And of course, this is kind of the flip side of uh, Brian Burnett's report from earlier this morning. This is the, uh, the total output. Uh, from Missouri high schools over the last oh, 14, 15 years of graduates. And you could see that it's broken down into the green, which is Missouri public high school, and red for Missouri private high schools. And as has long been anticipated, we're kind of now at a plateau. Not a lot of growth in these numbers. They'll probably bounce around at 70,000 or so for the next few years. And they may even diminish a bit. So that's really the marketplace, if you will, that we think about. And then among these, the percentage of high school graduates who go on to college, you could see this uh, from fall of 1992 through fall of about 2012. Uh, that's the most recent data that we have, 2011, 2012. And you can see that that's edged up from just under 50% in 92 to just over 60% in 2011, 12. So 60% of 70,000 is about 42,000 students uh, from the state of Missouri who go on to some form of higher education, whether it's at a private university, a public university, a two-year school, or a four-year school. When we now take that number and we start to look at what segment of that population comes to the University of Missouri system at our four uh, sister campuses, it looks something like this. If we look at our market share as a percentage of all Missouri high school graduates of the whole 70,000, it's about 9%. If we look at the percentage as a function of those graduates who stay in state, it jumps to about 17%. It's obviously bouncing around just under 20%. <coughs> if we look at all Missouri public institutions, including two-year and four-year, we're just over 20% of the market share. And this is the system as a whole. Moving on to all four-year institutions, which would include Wash U and other private institutions, we're taking about 30% of that market share. And finally, if we compare ourselves just to other four-year public universities, we're in there at about 40% market share. Obviously, we'd like to grow that and think about ways that we can grow that. And I know this is very much on the president's mind. And I think uh, when we look at 36, 38, 40, since 2001, 2006, 2011, that's a bit of growth. But we'd like to see it go up higher. And we'd like to take more of that market share. Uh, if we can. We think we provide a valuable education to people who come here, and there are a lot of questions and things to think about as to how we might do that. 
we move on and then compare ourselves not just to ourselves, but to other universities in the region, other university systems in the region, you can see that we are right in the middle of this grouping that includes the University of Illinois, Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, uh, Oklahoma, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. Uh, in terms of market share, as I said, we're in there just under 10%. That puts us way above Illinois, but not as high as Kansas. So we're in the middle. So we have room to grow, if you believe these numbers, and move more in this direction. In terms of state aid, compared to federal and institutional aid, none of this will surprise you. Uh, the change from FY10, unfortunately, is down another 12% uh, in state aid. Uh, the good news is that federal aid has gone up by 6%. Institutional aid has gone up by 22%. And other forms of aid from private investors and uh, from private banks and so, sorry, private foundations and the like, has gone up by 36%. So in total, the change from FY10 is up about 12%. That total number in FY14 is on the order of just under $900 million system-wide in total aid. That's gone up since 2010 when it was just under $800 million. Student loads now comprise about 50% of all the financial aid that undergraduates take. And you'll see how this plays out later when we break this down for you in terms of family income. Uh, in FY14, total grants were about 235 million compared to 192 million in 10. That's a 22% growth. Loans have gone up to about 295 million, just under 300 million in other words, about a 7% increase. Employment fills the gap that's work study and other forms of employment at about 8% growth since 2010. And so overall now, uh, we're looking at about $576 million coming from these three forms. And of that, loans is a significant fraction. It's about, not quite, but on the order of half. look at change in financial aid for Missouri residents, it's been pretty flat across the board. So the red is aid recipients with need. Uh, lots of, uh, that's got a federal definition associated with it. Uh, blue is aid recipients with no need. Those are people getting aid for a variety of reasons, uh, discounting as well as other reasons uh, who are people who otherwise uh, have good grades. It may be merit. It may be merit. Uh, money that they're getting for. And then those students who pay full but receive no aid uh, is at the bottom in green. So overall, uh, LaShonda and Randy have pointed out to me that the change from 2010 is on the order of 8% in terms of uh, growth in financial need or numbers of students with financial need. But really, if you look at these numbers, you know, except for this jump right here, it's been kind of flat. And it's still fairly high. If we now look at change in financial need for non-residents, and I know this came up earlier, it's kind of an interesting story also. <clears throat> uh, if we look in the red again at aid recipients with need, uh, that's gone up from about 2,000 people in FY10 to almost 3,200 people in FY14. For aid recipients from out of state who don't have need, that's also grown. So it's gone from about 2,400 to almost 3,100 uh, this past year. And that's a pretty significant growth of about 30%. And then those who pay full from out of state with no aid, that's also gone up, and that's a good thing, uh, from about 1,100 to 2,080. And I think Brian would agree that those are the kinds of students we really need some of, because they're paying full freight and they're paying full freight from out of state. Let's move on to the gap between the budgeted cost of attendance and the average grant in aid for resident undergraduates. I've chosen just to focus on residents. And I think there's a little issue here probably in going between computers. So the budgeted cost of attendance in 2010 was 22,000, 2014 was 23,3. Very small increase, about 5.8% over four 
years. You heard Brian speak about that already, or $1,200, $1,300 over that period. The average grant and aid is about $4,800, as you can see here. Right? That leaves a gap of about $18,000 in terms of the cost of attendance. If we take out the cost of, of uh, living, uh, travel, books, and the like, and look just at tuition and fees, here we see that it's grown by about 10% in tuition and fees from 8,400 to 9,400 over that period, about $1,000. Average grant and aid is in this category about 4,800. The gap just on the tuition and fee side is about $4,600. Now, one could argue that it's hard to find a cheaper place to live than a university. And, and one would have those costs wherever you are. Uh, but it's clear that the costs and the gap on the tuition side are, are pretty significant, particularly when we look at students coming from low-income families, okay. which is where we are now. Can you go back to the slide? Let me just make a point. Sure. Uh, that uh, budgeted cost of attendance is retail. Yes. That's full tuition, full books, no discounting. If you look at the previous two charts, is those students that pay full retail, we have about 7,000. That's the combination. That's right. Of, so we have less than 10% of our students paying full retail, which is that top line. Sure. The other 90% have some sort of need-based or merit-based discount that reduces that number. That's right. Absolutely correct. Thank you. Okay. We move on then and we look at unmet need by income level for residents. Uh, the way this is partitioned is uh, as follows for students who come from families with annual incomes less than 20,000, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100, and above 100. And the story is what you'd expect. The yellow bar is the unmet need. That has to be supplied either by some form, uh, employment or perhaps family or, or something. Uh, and you can see it's pretty significant and has remained significant, has grown uh, for students who are in the low income categories that are shown down here. So that's serious and that's significant and we care about that. We're always looking for ways to try to bring that up. And this is a place where if we could get a bit more uh, state funding or even more efficiencies, I suppose, uh, we could bring that, that bar down a bit. You also notice that for students who are in this category, uh, there's very little or no unmet need. So those students are doing fine. It's a story across the country, not just in Missouri, that students who come from upper income families are just not feeling the pinch in higher education. And the students who are coming from low income families are really feeling it. Uh, it's often stated that students in the middle are feeling it the most, uh, probably not true. Probably still students from lower income families feel it the most. And then if we look at demographics, this is our class and our classes at each of the campuses and overall mapped to low-income demographic of recent state high school students. And if I remember correctly, this has to do with the number of students who are eligible for free lunch or Pell eligible. That's how these numbers are established. And so what we see here is in uh, 2008, uh, here are our numbers. This is MU, this is uh, UMKC, S&T, and, uh, and then over here we have uh, UMSL as well. And what we see is that essentially we've done better in going from 2008 to 2013. I'm particularly proud of the fact that uh, at this, when we look at the total numbers who are receiving Cal uh, grants, we're doing better than we've done before, uh, but we're not doing as well as we might like to but with major kudos going out to our two urban campuses where they're really serving uh, a number of people and many, many students who come uh, from the low-income demographic. I could say more about that later if you want, but looking at it in terms of underrepresented minorities uh, and the demographic as a function of the recent state high school graduates, <clears throat> the underrepresented minorities among high school graduates is this bar, and in particular, you can see that if we compare the system as a whole, right here, the difference between the height of this bar and this one uh, has diminished in going from 2008 to 2013, which means that, again, our sister campuses, especially at St. Louis and UMKC, are serving more underrepresented minority students than they were in the past. Uh, that's particularly true if you look at what's uh, shown here in this wonderful bar at UMKC. 
And overall then, when we mix the numbers, that means we're getting pretty close to uh, the total number of students coming to the University of Missouri system who are from underrepresented groups as a percentage of the whole, being very close to the percentage that they actually represent among high school graduates. And I think that's a good thing. So the key points, just to summarize this and leave time for questions, two-year public universities we know uh, continue to capture the majority of first-time college students in all regions of the state. So if you come from a family where your parents haven't gone to school, you're more likely not to go to a four-year university first. We might think about that. UM's market share is dominant among public four-year schools, but we could always improve it overall. Compared to state institutions in nearby states, we're, we're about in the middle in terms of a market share of recent high school graduates in our own state. Perhaps we can improve. And UM continues to increase the number of low-income and minority students who are moving closer, and we're moving closer to reflecting the demographics of recent state high school graduates, which is a good thing. So lastly, enrollments continue to increase. Financial aid trends indicates that students with financial aid and need rather continue to receive access to the university. But lower income in undergraduates continue to have the largest amount of unmet need, continue to take out the greatest number of loans and the largest loans, and continue to receive the largest grant aid awards, which again is not too different than what I told you a year ago, and I suspect it won't be too different a year from now unless something dramatic were to happen. I'd be happy to answer questions or field questions. I have a question. Yes. So those two last charts you showed us for the, um, yes. So this is based on first time, like fresh out of college students, correct? Uh, this is fresh out of high school. Fresh out of, fresh sorry, out of high school. High school. Okay. Yeah. Percentage of underrepresented students coming out of high schools in Missouri, it's about 16% back in 2008. It's now up around 21%. Okay. I think that. Or if, fifth. This chart makes sense to me in terms of looking at the underrepresented minorities, but the prior one, yep. I wonder, just because campuses like UMSL, where the majority of our students are transfers, I don't know if it fully captures the full picture of the Pell Grant um, recipients of the student body at campuses like UMSL, where, I was just curious. I'm going to turn to the chancellor to let him comment, because I know I've heard him answer that before. Yeah, it's an interesting comment. I had just whispered to Zora a few minutes ago the same thing. I mean, three quarters of our first-time students are not out of high school. They're transfers, and our average age is 28. So, I mean, this is very interesting data. I like it, but I'm not sure it reflects, for at least our campus, okay. you know, the student body. Uh -huh. That's what I was curious mm -hmm. about. Okay. Yep. Dr. Foley, I, yes. I have a question. Uh, the numbers on slide eight and slide nine. Yep. Uh, this we've got more was. students than that. Is this FTEs or what is this? This is, um, do you want to comment on that, uh, Randy? Do we use headcount or FTE for this? LaShama. I think it's headcount, but I'm. Those are uh, full-time non-residents. Why don't you go ahead and come to the microphone and you can insert that point about Metro fee students. That's in the non-resident. What about the resident? Those are strictly uh, full-time degree-seeking students within the university. So part-times are not counted, non-degree seekings are not counted. So, and the one the uh, non-resident does not include the metro fees. Thank you. Students, so. David, I, I mean, Curator and, Steelman. And, 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 no, David's fine. Uh, it, the president asked a question that I wasn't clever enough or bright enough to follow on discounting, and I think it's the one I was looking for an answer to. Can you just run through those two charts again of what he was pointing yes, at? Yes, sure. 10? So let's do the resident first. And what we're trying to do here is map 
those students who have financial need against those students who don't have financial need against those students who get some aid but don't necessarily need aid. And particularly when we talk about residents, this goes back to my earlier concern on yep. residents versus non-residents, are these residents of Missouri, are, are these people who are paying resident tuition? Can't pay uh, I don't think I could take that apart. Well, I, well, except you can have waivers, and you can also. Now these are these are officially resident students. <laughs> May, can you? Yeah. I, I I don't think you can pay resident tuition if you're not a resident. Correct. You can't. But what about the waivers? That, you that, could get that, discounting, and that's certainly well, happening. That's what I'm asking. Is, yes. Is, is, that's what, I, I'm sorry. I, that's what I'm trying to understand. Is is when when you. This doesn't include any discounting then. This, this, that's all I'm trying to understand. Does this include any discounting? Well, we're not really looking at what they're paying. We're looking at the number of students who are receiving aid. So answering the question of how much discounting is occurring is something I can't do with these okay, charts, that's but I could question. figure it out. Yeah, but we could kind of figure it out. I think, you know, if you look at this chart, you know, um, the blue line represents students who are coming in from out of state who are getting some sort of aid, and that includes discounting. Okay, that. I think that's what you're really asking. That's what I understand. Okay. Yeah. So the green on page nine, that is non-residents paying full, full non-residents. Full right. Right. And, and did, did, our, where are Metro, where did Randy say, where is Metro on this page nine? Uh, the Metro students aren't counted in this, so we where? treat them as resident students. I think they get counted in the previous slide. You, we treat them as non-resident paying so. resident tuition. Yeah, I think they're uh -huh. resident <laughs> tuition paying. <laughs> that was my, okay. Yeah, yeah. but the, the numbers are not huge. The, can there. you tell me how many, how many non-residents do we discount? How many non-residents do we discount? Tom, how many do you discount? Uh, it's not a huge number. It's not a huge number. A huge number. Uh, Leo? We don't have a lot of non-resident. I think the I think your other number about uh, when we count a resident, I don't think that was including Metro. I think you said earlier that number didn't include Metro. So the Metro right. students it does not just don't none of these two slides, time. the Metro students are not included okay. in none of these in two either slides. slides. Okay. So what is it, maybe a thousand students at most across maybe. the system who are Metro? Oh, I don't think something oh, no. in that. No, not, that. Not nearly that high. Not even that high. No. 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 So uh, Curator Steelman's That's probably awesome. under, well under a thousand students. Okay. We're getting that deal for living on the border. Now, okay. there was something else I wanted to say to you, but I, I can't go I do that to myself all yeah, the time. Yeah, I had a great comment. And it's just evaporating. <laughs> Sorry. Can, can I ask one? And, and yeah, please. By all means. Time. I don't understand all of this student discount. Okay, so when you're talking about this aid recipients with no need or aid recipients with need, and that includes discounting yes what so, do we if if so what if we're giving a, 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 or they have complete financial aid but they're still paying full non-resident freight is that on this are we because we're including loans in this are we not or are we not am I, did I miss that yeah this is everything so those students who are getting any kind of aid show up in, in that blue line or the red line. And that's my question. If, if, does that include then the blue line include non-residents that have a loan and pay full freight? Or does or no, is that? That would, that would be this line. That would be on this chart because those are non-resident. But, but, but that could be, OK, I've taken up too that, much time. I think no, I, no, no, I, no, I want to follow up a little bit with this. Sure, this could be uh, loans, this could be discounting, this yeah. could be a lot of things. All of that counts as aid, right? And, and so first thing that happens is we calculate the student's need for aid based on family income, right? Once we've seen that, we establish what their need for aid is, and, and then we go from there. So if a student uh, doesn't need aid, but they're trying to be attracted here, there'll be some discounting and some aid put on the table. Ken Dean, are you out there? Yeah. <laughs> Ken and I have talked a lot about this over the last year and a half. But you would agree with that, right? Same Never mind. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Uh, the point is that in order to attract students from out of state, we often provide, quote, aid, which is really the form of a discount. Yes. Yes. On out-of-state tuition costs. 
But we do the same thing for in-state. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, we absolutely do. Okay. Yeah. So, Hank, on, yep. on uh, page 15, your summary. Yes, sir. You, you highlight the fact of lower income graduates, and of course, we're trying to grow those, as I understand. We are. But yet, it's not we, we grow them, but they continue to take out the largest loans, which means when they graduate, they've got more money to pay back, which really puts them in a hole, and maybe they'd be better off not coming to school if we're going to put them in that position. Uh, I, I won't go that far, but it certainly puts them in a tough position. I mean, that's an argument, depending, that, that's depending, an argument that could be made. Some have made that argument. Some have made the argument that that's why two-year trade schools would be a better option for some students to go after. One can make that argument. It um, seems like that's, that's an area that we really somehow that, need to focus on maybe a little more. And I don't have the answer. I'm just Well, I, I think that if we look at Chancellor Lofton uh, and the other chancellors, uh, I think you'd find that all of them would say that that's where they're, why they're putting so much effort on development, right? If I look at Chancellor Schrader back there, development is where we're going to try to fill that gap, uh, Curator Snowden, with money that just doesn't come from the state anymore. Uh, Phil, there's a great report uh, that we look at on a regular basis, which is loan default rate. And we compare very favorably to national trends, and we compare favorably uh, to those other institutions uh, in the state of Missouri. But well, we ought to get you and the curators the recent uh, loan default rate, which really talks to our people taking out too much loan that they can't pay back. It's a pretty complicated issue also because once students take loans, they don't always do what they're supposed to do with the loans. Um, so, for example, purchasing a car, renting a fairly costly apartment. Uh, sadly, this happens. And so I've talked to Tom quite a bit about this. and. Some of the students who show up at UMSL who never finish, never finish because they run out of aid. And, and when his people do an analysis of it, they find they spent the money not on education. So if, you know, as we look at this, there are, it, it's a complicated set of issues. The good news, I suppose, for the student is that the University of Missouri has kept costs low, lower than almost any other school in its category. And because of that, are schools in their categories. And because of that, even though low-income students still have these problems, the magnitude of the problem is smaller here than it is in other states, which is partially why our students aren't defaulting at quite as high a rate as they are elsewhere. Furthermore, as Curator Steelman said, if you graduate with a degree in electrical engineering and you have debt, that's one thing. If you graduate with a degree in other areas where it's not as immediate to get a job, that's a different thing. And so all of that means that I think we have to really look at this carefully. We want people to go into these other fields. We don't want them not to go into those fields. Uh, but they have to realize what they're getting into. But that's where development, I think, really plays a key role in trying to raise those development dollars. OK. Other questions, thoughts for the good of the order? Want to move on to e-learning then? I can't wait. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and here's a rope, huh? <laughs> OK. Uh, if we could switch over to e-learning, that would be great. Just be ready. OK, so today I'll provide you with a brief update on e-learning. Uh, I'll give you an introduction first, then I'll show a quick video, after which I'll review some basic data with you. You're getting data right now that we're handing out. Uh, from uh, Cindy Harmon. Uh, in your packets, these numerical summaries and statistics are essential to have. But I wanted to show you the video, and the team wanted to show you the video to sort of humanize the topic a bit for you and to get beyond just the numbers and the statistics, because at the core, uh, ultimately, this is about the very kind of thing we were just talking about, and that means students and faculty. The most important aspect of e-learning that may ultimately have the most impact societally is the ability to take knowledge and learning to the students when they want it, where they want it, and how they want it. And that's a huge paradigm change for us. Technology mediated by the web has greatly democratized information, and it's now democratizing higher education by making access much less of an issue. The single mother who's working, raising children, could finish her degree. The young man who may be place-bound somewhere in Missouri by circumstance 
can still partake of higher learning, and the professionals seeking to add new schools, skills can do so while maintaining their career. I think it was about 10 years or so ago that business leaders began to say when they realized what was happening that technology was, quote, the death of distance. Today, educators are realizing that technology will be the death of the lack of access to higher learning. Uh, it's clearly an exciting time for all of us, lots of innovation going on, but, edu but educators are only at the beginning of this change, this paradigm shift, if you will, both here in Missouri and indeed around the world. It was just in South Africa uh, at UWC and uh, University of Western Cape, a school that we've had a 28-year relationship with, and this is at the top of their list of things to think about. As Americans, we're more than enthusiastic about new technologies. We believe in them, and we have good reason for doing so. This is very true, obviously, when it comes to the impact of technology on education. We see new technology and tools, and we know that these will completely revolutionize higher education, and they will. And we don't have any doubt about that, nor should we. But the truth is that over time, as technology advances, it will become innocuous and embedded. In simple terms, what I really mean to say is that we just won't notice it. We still notice it today because it's new. Then the emphasis will once again be on students and their learning, and I'm quite proud to say that here at the University of Missouri, as you'll see in a moment, our focus has always remained on the students and their learning, even as we learn how to utilize and develop and deploy exciting new technologies. So where are we in our progress? At present, learning here at the University of Missouri takes on three modalities. The first is that which most of us experienced, which is face-to-face, -face, something like what I'm doing right now. But that's not the only thing that's happening in face-to-face -face education. There's lots of innovation in and around problem-based learning and sort of turning that paradigm on its head. The second modality would be hybrid courses which blend technology with face-to-face -to, -face to some degree. 80-20, 20-80, depends on the course, depends on the material being taught. So if we're teaching something like chemical engineering analysis, uh, pretty hard to do that with technology. Much easier to do that by breaking it down and doing problem-based learning face-to-face. -face. It's almost mentoring, if you will. On the other hand, if we're in a field where we have a lot of data and information that we have to give to a student and we have to transfer that from us to them, that's an area where technology works well. Fully online courses are a third modality. Some of these have little or no direct contact between the instructor and the student, except for the virtual contact, which students are frankly very comfortable with. Much more comfortable than any of us probably would be. And that's where there's tremendous opportunity for growth. As e-learning and web-based technologies improve, and as more new faculty who grew up as digital natives, right, come to us and join our universities, and as the students' expectations change, I think we're going to see continuously and rapidly more technology being integrated into these courses. It's inexorable. It's just going to happen. As more people with this much gray hair retire and more younger people come into the faculty, they're going to use these tools because they're very comfortable with them and they're conversant with the students on how to use them. In fact, that transition is now taking place so rapidly that I can honestly say that I can imagine a time when we could have 100,000 students enrolling in 100,000 different individual instantiations of the same course, each with their own start time and end date. And I'm looking at Gary Allen when I say that because our colleague at uh, Penn State used to say that five years ago and most of us scoffed when we heard him say it. Uh, but I think he was prescient and I think we could see that day coming now, just five years later. But that's not where we are today, and I have to emphasize that. Where we are today is somewhere between the traditional university that all of us attended and what will be sort of the technology extended mix of physical and virtual university of the future. The technology extended university will embody, I hope, the very best aspects of the physical university that we all experienced and the fully virtual university of the future. Okay, so to get at where we are in this progression, I do have the data and the statistics that I'll go over with you, and I can assure you that we're doing well. But before we boil it down to the numbers and the metrics, let's hear from the people. The people are engaged in this process of making the transition happen in reality. Let's hear from students, from professors, and also from instructional designers from different schools around the University of Missouri system. 
If I could ask you, please roll the tape. Students are expecting to have online classes as an option. Online learning is not left alone learning. I don't just post my notes and have people read. It's very interactive. And it's all about learning, using the best tools that you've got to be the best teacher you've got and to enhance the learning with the student. The technology that we use in our nursing programs is typically asynchronous. What this means is that the faculty and the students don't necessarily have to be online at the same time. I could log on at 2 o'clock in the morning if that's when I was up and do the work that I needed to do. So I could do it on my schedule and not somebody else's schedule. You know, anywhere that I could get Wi-Fi, I could do my homework and participate. This is what enables a student to be able to, for instance, live in a rural community, which may be three hours from Kansas City, and still able to enroll in a graduate program. We admit 95 students to our pharmacy program in Kansas City, 30 in Columbia, and 30 in Springfield. Most of our, our teaching is not done in a more traditional online format. Ours are real classroom settings. We're just utilizing technology to stream video and to stream discussion sessions. So we've, we've basically created a virtual environment where three, students at three sites are all coming together as one classroom via video technology. One of the main projects that I've been working on for the last year and a half is the Delta Lab project, and that stands for Delivering Experiential Labs to All. Our goal with the Delta Lab project is to hopefully get rid of some of the boundaries to education that we currently have. There is not enough space to accommodate all thousand students in one semester in the available laboratories that we have. So we want to make sure that we can deliver these labs to students who may not be able to get into those lab spaces for whatever reason. Students that do their activities outside of class, they actually need to go through the procedure by themselves and develop skills self-reliantly and independently. Whether it be through kits that are shipped to their home um, or kits that they might be able to use in common areas on campus, Students who are participating in these Delta Labs, the redesigned labs, are doing hands-on science. They're really doing experiential learning. They're doing exactly what our university has set out to do. The Gateway for Online and Adult Learners was created to provide a centralized direction and support for both online students and re-entering adult students uh, who are seeking a degree completion. What we've created is an environment where the students can work with a concierge who is going to be responsible for guiding the online student through the actual process. Students really want to have a personal touch. They want to have the experience uh, in an online class just like they would in a face-to-face -face class. I think at first it was difficult to kind of collaborate or facilitate this back and forth between students. I really, really like to talk to students. I think it's fun. Um, so at first I did kind of feel separated from them, but now I've developed different technologies so I can talk with them more and be more active. We were the very first online doctoral program at the University of Missouri 
and in fact we remain the only online doctoral program in the nation among our peers and that's really the reason why we have such an incredible demand for our graduate online program. The university actually had a pilot program called the Blackboard Collaborate and we were one of the first ones to start using it. On-site resident students and the online students could come together in one platform and have discussions across the board. Because most of us students are um, already working uh, as professors, as professionals, and they hardly find time to come to the university such as this. And that's really one of the benefits of an e-learning program also, is the selectivity that you have. Because you have very ambitious people who are eager to advance professionally, it demonstrates that we have this market and it would never have been possible without e-learning. So e-learning has been a blessing to our program. There's a lot that, that online and e-learning can do for the system as a whole. We currently have a um, project in women's health that is funded by the system to work with UMSL in uh, developing women's health nurse practitioner coursework. Instead of both campuses offering the courses at the same time and utilizing two faculty members, we're able to utilize one faculty member and yet improve the access to courses. That's really an efficiency savings for the system. We have reduced the number of instructors that now engaged in this general chemistry course from six to three. We now have the opportunity to offer up to six more elective courses for our upper level students. Teaching is teaching. Um, and, and learning is learning. Whether it's online, whether it's in person, whether it's some combination thereof, um, the same basic things are there. We don't see classes or the traditional face-to-face -face classes just completely going away. We see online education as a way to provide more opportunities for the students. Because not every student has the ability or the resources to actually be in a class. But they want to get an education, they want to better their lives, they want to get that bachelor's degree that, that they've never gotten. So that's what online education actually provides. It provides those kinds of opportunities. Okay, uh, I'm not quite done, but I'm almost done. First, let me thank uh, the folks who produced that video. Susan Cameron, Jeremy Jardine. Susan, I think you're right back there. Good job. Uh, Jean David, Michael Bowles, Susan Hollingsworth. Where's Susan? Right? And Kelly Peary. I don't know if Kelly is here. Hi, Kelly. Good job. Okay, so let me highlight some of the key points of what you just heard, all right, and get away from the beautiful videos for a minute. In the recent past, many, even most faculty, were actually pretty leery of any shift away from traditional learning formats. But I think as you could see today, more and more faculty are embracing them. They see the value and the potential that this new learning technology provides. This is hugely important, the faculty mentality that is, and it can't be emphasized enough. Faculty attitudes are changing and they're changing fast. Second, as faculty gain experience with learning technologies, they're beginning to observe, and you heard Klaus talk about this, that outcomes for their students are just as good or in fact better with online formats and modalities. Third, e-learning technology provides opportunities for new and future academic partnerships between faculty at our four campuses and with other institutions. You heard that in the case of the pharmacy school, which I think is just a wonderful example of how we can extend that which we are doing at any one of our campuses, in this case UMKC, to our sister campuses within the system, but also to other campuses around the state, including in that case Missouri State University. I think that was really important because that addresses a critical need that the state faces in creating healthcare professionals. Fourth, using technology intelligently, we're able to educate the same number of students or frankly even more students with fewer faculty members. Now, I have to stop there because that scares people when I say it that way. But go back to the example, which is my favorite example, from Missouri S&T of general chemistry. Klaus didn't say, 
we had six people teaching this, we now only have three and we got rid of three, right? That's not what he said. What he said is we now teach the same number of students with only three faculty members. The other three faculty members are now available to teach other courses, to develop new courses, to teach courses that in the past could not be taught, taught at the upper level. And I think that leveraging is incredibly important. And I'm speaking now to my own faculty colleagues more so than the curators when I talk about this because we have to embrace this. This is coming and it will change the way things are done. So teaching, learning, knowledge creation, social engagement, things that we cherish and hold dear as faculty members at schools like this and others around the system will improve as we grasp and understand the full impact of this technology. Furthermore, one very important aspect of this revolution that is often overlooked and not spoken of is that we're educating young people who can now educate themselves continuously throughout their careers in ways that none of us autodidacts could have ever dreamed of. Professionals of today and tomorrow will be called on to learn continuously as never before just to remain viable. Therefore, we must teach students how to teach themselves, access information, assimilate knowledge, and do it, frankly, in shorter and shorter time frames. Like all good programs, though, we're continuously evaluating and monitoring our progress. And let me give you a few statistics now. So we began collecting data in 2002 on this topic. And since then, we've seen a 38.5% increase in the number of semester credit hours taken in 100% online courses. A 39% increase in the number of student enrollments in 100% online courses. And a 35% increase, and this is important, in the number of students in enrolling in at least one 100% online course. That's higher than the national average considerably. The national average is somewhere between 20 and 25%, and the University of Missouri system, we're already up to 35% growth. Since 2012, we've seen a 22% increase in the number of 100% online courses we have available, and a 100% increase in the number of semester credit hours taken in hybridized or blended courses where we flip the classroom. Furthermore, Steve Graham and I have provided resources from the system level to faculty who want to go further faster. Just this past year, we provided, through what we call the Intercampus Course Sharing Initiative, or ICSI, $250,000 towards the development of new online courses that are shared between the campuses. I really like this program because it does two things. It drives online and also drives collaboration and cooperation between the campuses. Uh, we have 34 new inter-campus courses, which may not sound like a lot to you, but that's more than zero, which is where we started. Uh, and we have a whole cadre of faculty members who are actually working together in different campuses in the university. And I think we all want that. We want cooperation, collaboration, and creation of courses. So I'm just going to finish with a brief allusion. Uh, all of us, at some point, willingly or unwillingly, read Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Uh, maybe at least the, uh, the cliff notes, if not the whole thing. And in it, um, Brutus famously says, and I'll paraphrase and summarize and shorten, there's a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune on such a full sea, we are now afloat. It's a beautiful quote. The University of Missouri is fully afloat on the full sea of this e-learning transition and paradigm shift. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Well, gosh, i got to have a comment because <laughs> how encouraging and uplifting the a report and how, how dramatic the increase has been in the last uh, few years. It really has. <clears throat> so, and you've captured uh, so much of, of what potential lies ahead. Uh, compliments, on the video was very helpful, anecdotal, but you've also followed up with some statistics. Mm -hmm. So I, I, really, uh, I really think uh, you and all those that have been participating are to be congratulated on progress being made. So a question for you is, um, incentives for faculty who may say, et tu brute, in, in, <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, their, their teaching methods, and uh, maybe they're not on board yet, uh, are there things that can be done uh, to 
give them encouragement and uh, uh, not only uh, dollar incentives for developing a particular program, but uh, uh, knowing that they could spend time in research or uh, publications, that, uh, that that will be perhaps replacing some of the coursework that, uh, that they won't have to do in terms of hours in the classroom? Uh, the answer is yes, and, and I'll, of course, elaborate and not just say yes. So, uh, first of all, I think the, the inter-campus course sharing uh, that we're doing is uh, phenomenally successful. Now, granted, we're putting money on the table to do that, but it's small amounts of money. We spent $250,000 last year out of total budget of billions. That's tiny. If we could do more of that, had more money to do that, I think we'd see more and more faculty do more of this kind of sharing, and I think that's where the future lies. Steve, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Secondly, um, we're, I'm really impressed by this guy, Klaus Full. Is Klaus here? Good, because he'd probably be embarrassed to hear me say <laughs> so many great things about him. But I met Klaus early on, and what I love about Klaus is, you know, he's such a German. Right? He looks at this thing, he says, we could solve this problem, I can engineer this. And he uses very low cost, very low cost, um, technology. I, mean, I think he was using MediaSite, which you could get almost for free. He's using a simple, cheap $30 uh, computer camera, and yet he's teaching, he's using frugal technology to have a huge impact. Just because it's frugal doesn't mean it's not good. In fact, it's fantastic. So what happens in that course, and I've seen them do it, is it's really cool. There's a screen like this. You see Klaus in one corner, and he's doing his thing, which he always does. And he's showing PowerPoint presentations, which he always does. So that's up there. But then the other thing is he's got a bank of TAs, seven of them, sitting there. And, and while the students are listening to Klaus speak, they're sitting there not being shy, not being afraid to interrupt, asking every question they can think of. So they're basically, it's, it looks like Twitter, right, like a Twitter feed. And Klaus sees that, but keeps talking, unless it's something where the TAs interrupt him. And the TAs answer those questions as they go along. Now, how many of you would have loved to have had that when you were in school, right? Because one of the biggest barriers to learning is, frankly, fear and intimidation of looking stupid, right? And so you don't ask the question. And you know, we all stand there and say there are no stupid questions. And so we try to encourage students, and every student knows there are lots of stupid questions <laughs> that you've got to ask them, right? And if you could do it privately in that context, especially in a field as difficult as chemistry, you know, it just changes the whole dynamic. What's interesting about that course is he cycles the students through, creates three groups, right, Steve? I think it's one group goes to class and goes to lecture. One group can take the lecture anywhere synchronously or asynchronously and another group can do both. And he makes all of the class do all three of those. And somewhere in the middle of the semester, they choose which one they like best. Guess which one they like best. They rather watch him on their iPad, sitting in the library with their friends or in the coffee shop, right, than going and sitting in the lecture. Now, the students who want to go sit in the lecture, by the way, do the same thing. They're watching what's going on. They can't afford not to. All right, so now suddenly, you know, what is it, Cheryl, 600 or so students a year, 700, 800? How many students take Gen Chem at yeah, your school every year? It's a phenomenal. Oh, I think it's over 1,000. Okay, so let's call it 900. So instead of having six people teaching that course, right, he's got three people teaching the course. The other three are doing other things. You know, when you start to think about that leveraging, it's not just the death of lack of access. It's the death of that whole idea of the student-teacher ratio. I'm sorry, it doesn't, it's not as relevant as it once was. When you see this happening, and you have to see it, it's really quite compelling. So that's all to say that uh, Steve and I are bringing Klaus into our office, and he's gonna become kind of our tele-evangelist on this stuff, John, right? <laughs> so we're gonna put him out there to try to get more people to try this. I'm looking at Dennis Miller in the back of the class who teaches about 800 students a year mm -hmm. in general psychology, right, Dennis? While also running faculty senate this year. I mean, if we could get this into general psychology, if we could get into early economics, uh, sociology, suddenly we could really reach a lot more students with these courses quickly with lower cost per credit hour 
and ultimately put those faculty back to work doing other things. That's the biggest issue, John, is getting faculty to believe that we're not going to shrink the faculty by doing this, but in fact, we're going to be a better university. With that, I think I should stop. Unless Thank you, you very much. Could, could you say one more thing, because I know the answer, and I think it's important for them to know. What is the success of the students and their grades who take courses like that? So uh, I think I have numbers on this in, in your sheet, but let me give you sort of the top of the, off the top of the head. Again, in the chemistry course, they've looked at this carefully, and the number of students who get Fs or withdraw from general chemistry at s and has dropped significantly. Uh, if, I'll get you the number, but big, big drop, <laughs> because the students just do better in this modality. You and I find that a little hard to believe because we're not digital natives. They like it this way. It makes sense to them to see a lot of things on the screen and things going on all at once and being able to ask questions and not have the formality of a lecture classroom. Okay, be happy to answer more questions, but I'd like to uh, cede over any time I have left to, uh, to the next speaker. Thank you. Steve Knorr. Thanks, Hank. You're, uh, you're giving me your time left. I'll just say that we're doing great. We got two Board of Creators approved this morning. Uh, that completes my report. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have any great quotes, but I do have, a, I guess I have a quote from Will Rogers. Hank, it uh, goes something like this. I don't make jokes. I just watch the government. I report the facts. <laughs> so that's my quote for you. <clears throat> Today, uh, we're going to revisit a strategic theme, the university relations team uh, seeks to advocate for higher education in the University of Missouri on a daily basis. Uh, so today I'm going to share with you three things. One is the communication strategy and how we engage and educate all of our constituencies, uh, including the local, state, and federal uh, officials, uh, alumni, businesses, uh, civic leaders, and the media. Two is a solid example of how these uh, conversations can result um, uh, and these groups coming together to solve an important issue for the state of Missouri. And finally, I'm going to talk about our four main legislative priorities uh, for this year. In 2013, the University Relations Team established a new um, communication strategy designed to promote the University of Missouri system to all six million Missourians in a way that has never been done before on the system level. The strategy involves a coordinated and consistent year-long schedule of proactive statewide media outreach, which includes proactive media, radio newspapers, interviews, op-eds, uh, in conventional newspapers, uh, specialty publications, and editorial board visits as well. Statewide outreach, show me value tour. We've had 18 visits uh, to communities promoting the value of higher education and the reach of the U University of Missouri system and a targeted emphasis through speeches and events on rural Missouri. As I've told this board before, 92 of 118 uh, rural uh, House members in the uh, uh, General Assembly are from rural Missouri. We need to spend more time in rural Missouri. Well, we have the uh, result. How have the results been for this strategy? Well, the plan was implemented in July of 2013, leading to an increase in positive media by 56% in 2013-2014, and that's compared to the previous year of 2012-2013. Thus far, in 2014-15, our positive media has been up about 8%. And so keep in mind, this was the first time we've done this, so you can understand why there might be a, a little bit of a difference in that number. <clears throat> During our last Board of Curators meeting, Curator Stewart asked uh, me a, a very pointed question. He said, what do we need to do differently in Jefferson City now after the elections? And my, my response to him, if you recall, was keep doing the sound fundamental uh, of running the university, and we would continue to build the credibility to move the university and higher education forward. Now, what did I mean by that? Here's a perfect example. During the last Board of Curators meeting, Vice President Brian Burnett outlined the efficiencies and effectiveness report, and specifically our $48 million in savings. The university relations team then was able to take that information and get it around all over the state. On January the 4th, Hank Waters, of the Columbia Daily Tribune wrote an editorial comment commending the president and the board for using tactics 
that would make sense in any business venture. You see, sometimes the greatest advocacy of the University of Missouri comes from the actions that you take. Again, I think it echoes what Curator Stillman said this morning. We've had the opportunity to build on what we were doing in Jefferson City after the election, and you see several photos behind me here. We've had the opportunity to welcome freshmen, the new freshmen to campus uh, in the freshman tour. They had the chance to learn about our mission, our efforts to solve the STEM shortage problem, and see our world-class research. President Wolf has been making the rounds in Jefferson City, visiting with legislative leaders about our priorities, and we look for every opportunity to showcase the university. We have invited all of our constituents to come together in, on Legislative Day on February the 25th to rally in Jefferson City at the Capitol to talk about our priorities. Later this month, the Missouri football team will be uh, in the Capitol showing the Citrus Bowl Championship Trophy, always a popular day in the Capitol, and we thank the student athletes, our alumni, our friends who take the time to come to Jefferson City uh, to talk about the university. We must use all of our um, efforts to hit and, uh, as far as advocating in uh, the capital. <clears throat> so what does it look like when you have an issue that needs the University of Missouri to solve a problem? Well, here's an example. The University of Missouri and civic leaders in, in Springfield came together to secure $10 million in core funding so we can expand the medical school in order to address the critical workforce shortage of physicians in Southwest Missouri. This coalition was formed a few years ago, and in fact, the Board of Curators met with the Springfield leadership whenever former Board of Curator John Carnahan from Springfield was on the board to discuss the growing problem and how the state's land-grant institution could help solve the problem in Southwest Missouri. We serve all six million Missourians in every part of the state. And I think it's safe to say a decade ago, you would not have seen the presidents from the University of Missouri and Missouri State uh, leadership from Cox and Mercy Hospitals or Columbia and Springfield Chambers come together to send an op-ed op letter uh, in order to raise awareness of an issue. Just to briefly, just to review briefly, this is the second year of this program that has been funded. Last year we had ten million dollars that was put into our core budget for the MU Medical School to expand their class size from 32 students per year to 128 students per year. This gave us the opportunity to begin to get staff in place, and we even had eight students into the program last fall. However, because of budget shortfalls, $10 million were withheld, and that puts the program in jeopardy going forward. So as you can see in front of you or behind me, the governor released $4.68 million on last, this Tuesday, which allows for the momentum to keep the program going. We thank Governor Nixon for being creative and finding a solution for this important program. <coughs> These funds came from a lawsuit that was settled by the state. We thank the legislative members of the House and the Senate, uh, particularly <coughs> Appropriations Chair Kurt Schaefer, for their commitment to this program. I cannot stand here today and say whether the op-ed letter on January the 23rd from the coalition was the difference of, in funds being freed up this week or not. But what I will say is that it is a reflection of many years of work built by this coalition to address a serious problem in the state and force people to think creatively to solve it. This is, a, this is an example of how President Wolf challenges us on a daily basis to think creatively, take risk in order to move the state forward. I will now briefly go over our four priorities for the upcoming year in Jefferson City. <clears throat> the core budget of the University of Missouri is always front and center. The $10 million for the medical school that I just mentioned as, as far as expansion and the maintenance and repair bonding proposal and finally finding a way to creatively uh, fund the 50-50 projects for our four targeted projects on our campuses. In addition, we are working to and tracking more than 225 bills uh, currently in the uh, State House that could affect the University of Missouri in some way. As we tell the story and how the university is doing, it's uh, part to be efficient and streamlined. We must always emphasize to legislators and to the public that the state support for the university is crucial to our success in fulfilling our mission to the state. It takes operating support, capital funding for us to do that. In this current year, we continue to watch a slowly improving economy with a revised estimate of 4.6% growth at the end of the fiscal year. Earlier this week, 
The year-to-date numbers through January have the state economy at 4.9% growth. So we have good news, but we need to continue to see strong growth. The governor and the legislature have agreed on a consensus revenue estimate for fiscal year 16 of 3.6%, and this is a step in the right direction. As you recall, last year, they were unable to agree on a consensus revenue, and it, it ultimately provided for a tough uh, budget year in the end. We're, pro we're pushing for a 5% increase in performance funding again this year that would match last year's increase. It takes 3% increase from the state just to meet our mandatory expenses for the year. So at least, or at a minimum, we're asking for the 3.6% in the consensus revenue and pushing for 5%. The governor in his state of the state address on January the 21st recommended 1.3% of core funding increase for higher education or $12 million. For the University of Missouri, that would mean 5.7 million to our core. He also touted his support for the appropriations of maintenance and repair projects supported by the bonds authorized by lawmakers last year. Amendment 10, passed by voters last year, stipulated that the governor could no, no longer recommend funds in his budget that are dependent on passage of initiatives not yet approved by the legislature. So therefore, he's also issued a proclamation along with his recommendations that if lawmakers approve revenue generating initiatives, including the expansion of Medicaid and passage of the tax amnesty proposal, he would recommend an additional $13 million for higher education into our core funding or 6.2 million more for the University of Missouri. That would bring our overall increase to 11.9 million or 2.79%. However, political realities are what they are, and Medicaid expansion passing this year seems pretty slim. Earlier, I went over the $10 million for the uh, MU Medical School expansion at Southwest Missouri, uh, in Southwest Missouri at the Cox and Mercy Hospitals. I won't go into that in details. I will just say that these funds must be built into our core to ensure that the program can move forward on a sustained basis <coughs> year after year. It's a simple, simple but difficult goal for the year. Last week, the Senate passed Senate Resolution uh, 9 by Senator Parsons that authorizes $200 million in bonding for higher education projects. If passed, the, the funds uh, would be $98 million for the University of Missouri. The projects outlined, as a reminder, are Laffrey Hall, which has already received $38.5 million, Stewart Hall at MU, Spencer, Hall, Spencer Chemistry and Biological Sciences Building at UMKC, Shrink Hall at at Missouri S&T, Benton Hall at, at uh, UMSL. These building needs are in line with the STEM needs of the state. Now the bill goes to the House to be included in the capital bills, uh, appropriations bills. We're working with them and campuses to identify our projects and match state dollars as well. And we're uh, in the process of moving these maintenance and repair projects forward. As you may recall, finally, uh, we've raised over $30 million for private donors to use uh, to match towards the 50-50 projects on our four campuses. We're looking for another avenue to be able to fund these buildings. And so this year, we're trying to look creatively at the $200 million that was set aside for the Fulton Mental Health Hospital. It was taken care of by a different form of funding last year. This will allow us to hopefully come in and make some language changes to the $200 million to find a new avenue for the 50-50 cost share facilities. Uh, I would just like to say on that front, it will create at least 1,200 uh, 1200 jobs. It will serve over 10,000 students um, in these facilities. But even more than that, we maintain the trust with our private donors when it comes to private-public partnerships with the University of Missouri and the state. See, they're watching. They put their money on the table and now they're looking for the state to help out. And protecting that trust in this upcoming year is critically important. So to wrap up, uh, our overall message is that we have a method to our madness. We're uh, pro in the process, um, in place of communicating our message. These messages are supported by our many constituent groups, not just one. Our goal is simple, to get all the parties together, to engage and educate them with the objective of thinking creatively, taking the needed risk, and actions to solve problems and advocate for higher education, the University of Missouri, and really the state as a whole. So that completes my report. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Are there, are there questions? I have one no? question. 
Steve, uh, on uh, you talk about 50-50 match projects, the language change. What kind of language change are you talking about? So there was, uh, out of the $600 million that was uh, passed in the bonding bill last year, $200 million was set aside for specifically for the uh, university's higher education for maintenance and repair. And so that was the earlier one. There was $200 million in there for state facilities. And there was another $200 million set aside for the Fulton Mental Health Hospital. Since that was taken care of by a different avenue, that is the $200 million that we're targeting to have that language change that we may be able then to go uh, after for our 50-50 projects. Anything else for Steve? If not, thank you very much, Steve. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, that concludes this portion of the Committee of Academic Student External Affairs meeting. Thank you. Uh, Curator Phillips, I believe we're ready to start on the uh, combined academic, student, and external affairs and compensation human resources reports. Very good. <clears throat> well, we have uh, two action items today. One is to review and act on the um, collected rules and regulations, particularly with respect to faculty and staff processes. Uh, and then the second action item that we will cover, which I think will take less time is to act on those same CRRs with respect to the equal employment uh, policy to bring it uh, to uh, compliance with current changes in federal law. Uh, and I'll just give a brief introduction to, uh, for the new curators and for those who've joined the system since uh, last year that uh, we had an aha moment a year ago caused by some unfortunate circumstances uh, that uh, caused uh, the university to spring into action. I think we can all compliment uh, President Tim Wolf for his immediate response and for bringing the board forward with some band-aid approaches to addressing uh, the collective rules and regulations which uh, which had not been revisited for a while and which needed to be updated. And so we did uh, uh, take care of the most uh, pressing of issues. And since that time, there have been um, m a multitude of meetings with staff, faculty, um, students to acquaint them with the near-term changes, but also to bring them forward uh, to address additional changes that need to be made in our processes and systems. And uh, I think President Wolf was going to give us an overview of that. Um, in advance of that, I've got to say that having observed the work, uh, kudos to the collaborative fashion and the, the, the prompt uh, uh, response that the university system has made in the last several months in uh, bringing back to us some additional changes. Um, and I don't think that it's a, a finished product. It's a, a work in process. Uh, we're going to have uh, the opportunity after uh, President Wolf speaks to approve, but also to have a continuing review of this because it is so important that we get it right. And it's kind of a changing target. I think we're now ahead of most universities uh, but uh, in the next year or two, there will be perhaps some additional nuances to the process, and I'm sure we will all, uh, we will all be uh, uh, attuned to that. So, President Wolf, if you give us the overview. Good afternoon. It's... Uh after lunch, and I don't know about you, you get a little bit sleepy, so I'm going to ask the lights to come up. Uh, I don't have any charts, uh, so I think that uh, uh, it will help a little bit uh, with this important topic. As uh, Curator, found it, Curator Phillips said, uh, the board has in front of them changes to our collected rules. I want to emphasize what Curator Phillips said was we've gotten to this point through a collaborative team effort. And this collaborative team effort was composed of faculty, staff, students, our consultant, NCIRM, and our leaders at the University of Missouri system. And this represents 
the most innovative uh, approach towards uh, handling these unfortunate situations in a fair and complete uh, way. And uh, what I'd like to do is spend, it, spend some time reviewing how we got to this particular point. As uh, Curator Phillips said about a year ago, uh, we had a wake-up call and uh, we responded. I'd, I'd asked uh, at that time for the Board of Curators to hire an outside independent counsel to conduct an investigation on the matters pertaining to Sasha Minyakori. I also asked our four chancellors to lead a comprehensive review of their campus policies, training, and procedures concerning the prevention and reporting of sexual harassment and assault and the availability of mental health services on each of the campuses. As part of this, I established a mental health sexual assault task force with the charge to see through the execution of this effort and lead a compre comprehensive and very intense review of current campus policies, practices, and protocols. In addition, as part of that announcement over a year ago, I promised that I would put money where my mouth was and invest in resources necessary uh, to solve some of the weaknesses or gaps that we had as part of this process. Interesting, uh, yesterday I was listening to uh, some of the coaches talk about, it was signing day, and some of the coaches talking about how happy they were for these student athletes and that this decision by that student athlete was the biggest decision of their lives. Uh, and it's going, that decision that they made would influence their life, the rest of their life. And when I thought about that, it's not just our student athletes, but it's each of our 77,000 students on our campuses that invested their time and hard earned money in coming to one of our four campuses. And because of the importance of this decision that was highlighted yesterday in signing day, we need to follow through on this initiative uh, with uh, intensity and abandon so that we can have the most safe and secure environment and cultural respect of any campus in the United States, uh, better yet, any campus on a global basis. So let's, let me talk about our progress so far. We did, as asked, inventory and assess our uh, current policies and practices, and we did hire a consultant, NCIRM, to, in, to take a look at what we had inventoried. So we didn't want to just do a self-inspection and assessment of where we wanted. We, had, we wanted expert opinion and they gave us uh, some very, very candid advice as to where we are and where we should be. We did engage student faculty and staff leaders from each of our campuses to ensure that we got their feedback and uh, we included that feedback and recommendations in the policy changes we've made so far. Uh, we have revised some collected rules and regulations so far. We've had issued some executive orders as well uh, and during this process, I and others were asked to participate in these national conversations so that we also could give influence on what that federal uh, mandate or that federal agenda might look like. We have created a centralized website with links to all campus Title IX and mental health resources for updates, reporting, and training. Also on that website, it gives us a clear path on where we're going and what activities will be accomplished and when and by who. So it gives visibility to everybody on the extended team on what we're going to be doing in the future. I want to thank hundreds and hundreds of people on our campuses for participating in our investigator training, our coordinator training. Uh, we also trained deputy co coordinators, hearing panelists, appeal officers. We launched a system-wide training effort. Wasn't the best launch of our lives, but we did launch one. Uh, we had some technical issues. Uh, we've apologized for that. I'll apologize as well. Uh, in the essence of, of speed, uh, we put out something that wasn't ready for prime time. We have made the changes from a technology standpoint. We're now seeing that 80% of mandatory reporters have taken that training. I apologize for those of you, uh, especially a curator, a specific curator, for the time that you, for the four hours you spent on the weekend trying to take that education. Uh, but we will learn that before we roll something out, we need to, to test it a little bit better going forward. Uh, one of the things that's probably uh, I'm, I'm most proud about, and it's worth um, bragging to everybody here, is what's happened uh, in terms of creativity on our campus uh, and the engagement of students, faculty, uh, and staff in promoting awareness of the societal issue is really remarkable. 
And I want to talk about what's happened on each of the four campuses. First of all, I'll start on, uh, here at MU. MU has Missouri, Missouri, Mizzou Cares panel presentation that took place on January 30th. More than 100 faculty, staff, and students attended the Mizzou Cares panel breakfast about Title IX, FERPA, and the at-risk committee. They launched Not Anymore Training, an online interpersonal violence video-based program with modules on sexual assault, rape culture, bystander intervention, dating domestic violence, healthy relationships, stalking, and what to do if you're in a difficult situation. s and members of the Athel Psi Omega Theater fraternity at s and dispelled the taboos associated with mental health issues with their sellout, standing room only performance of Next to Normal as part of Mental Health Awareness Week in January. At UMKC, Student government unanimously passed a resolution December 1st to support the It's On Us campaign. Core groups of students from student government, government, fraternities, sororities, and the med school working on a collaborative partnership with OSI and the Women's Center to bring the Green Dot program to Kansas City. At UMSL, campus created a unique bystander intervention focused program called Speak Up and Speak Out last spring. Since this training, they have seen a substantial increase in the actual number of bystanders, bystanders who have reported Title IX offenses to campus officials. All eight of the intimate partner violence incidents which occurred on ca in campus residents were reported to campus police department by a fellow student. Data also shows that in the past two years, a positive shift has been made in the number of students who reported would feel comfortable intervening as a bystander. So let me transition now to what we will continue to do. We plan to revisit and revise current rules as necessary. We will continue to use the collaborative team approach that has been so, success so successful to date. We will be conducting a climate survey of all students to understand prevalence and perceptions of sexual misconduct reporting processes, and perceptions of the university's response and overall culture towards sexual misconduct. We are continually reviewing what we've completed to evaluate the effectiveness and implementation of new policies, including those that I'm asking you to vote on today. In this regard, let me acknowledge the letter signed by several faculty members seeking to amend the proposed rules regarding the role of advisors during hearings. I commit to them that I report back to them and IFC, who has been the leader, and Dennis Miller, who is here in the audience, has been the champion from IFC on this, this task force. I will report back to them by the end of 2016 on our experience regarding the role of advisors, and I will be open to recommending amendment of the rules based on that experience. We will continue to seek feedback and advice from students, faculty, and staff on what we need for the best possible policy. We are evaluating proposals for strategic funding for specific needs related to the Title IX requirements on each of the four campuses. We're encouraging campuses to look for collaborative efforts based on these proposals. At the system level, we will be investing in case management software for each of the campuses so as to track discrimination claims, including Title IX, and it will enable Title IX teams to update cases, record evidence, and document every phase of an investigation. We have to get the leaders in place. We, one one uh, successful hire is we hired a full-time legal counsel with Title IX expertise, in addition to a full-time Title IX coordinator for, for MU, that's, that's very close to be, being hired, and that will be a shared responsibility between MU and the system. Uh, we'll continue to work towards our aspirational goal of changing the culture and becoming a national model with best practices in place to ensure our campuses are safe and secure. At the end of this year, we will have a Title IX annual report to the board. So we will make sure that it's part of our cadence with the board where we report on our progress, not only from a results standpoint, but our progress relative to the implementing of these collected rules and the processes that we have in place. 
we are becoming a national leader. Our belief is that our process for adjudicating assault and harassment cases, training for critical roles, the language codified in the collected rules and regulations is becoming best practice in higher education. I asked Brett Sokolow, the CEO and founder of MCIRM, one of the largest consulting organizations in this space, and I asked him what his opinion is about our progress and where we need to go. And let me quote Brett. I am pleased with the progress of the University of Missouri since our partnership began in spring of 2014. The university is well on its way to becoming, becoming an exemplar and role model of campus safety. Title IX reporting, compliance, prevention, and education. So we've got an, an expert in this area that's giving us compliments. Although the progress is evident, we're not done. There's always more to do. This is certainly in the category of a never-ending journey. The things that we have to do that we're focused on right to really reach this exemplar status is get the leaders in place. We're making some progress. We've got some holes that we still need to fill. We need to make sure we have highly trained individuals in each of the, the, leader, the leaders, uh, underneath the leaders, so that the organization is, is in place and ready to go. Uh, we need to have these policies that uh, are in front of you approved, uh, and we anticipate and prepare the board for further uh, revisions to these policies based on the input and experience as we continue to navigate these difficult issues that come forth. We need to ensure that we implement the policies that we've codified in collected rules and regulations. Uh, we need to implement strategic prevention curriculums across the system. We've had our consultant on each of the four campuses auditing and looking at exi existing uh, preventative curriculums, and we need to do more. It, again, it's, it's a never-ending educational opportunity for us. We have to monitor progress, compiling data from climate studies that we're going to do this year, and ongoing training to meet the needs of VAWA, which will go into effect in July of this year. I'm making it my responsibility as leader of this institution to continue to challenge and ensure progress so we, abt we do obtain our aspirational goal of being a national exemplar and moving the needle from good to great. We owe it to our great students, our great employees who have invested their future in us to have a safe and secure environment where sexual harassment and assault will not be tolerated. I ask for your approval of the collected rules that we have in front of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> President Wolf, uh, very well said, and I think it really <clears throat> reaffirms the leadership that he's shown throughout the past year, the process that he's gone through. Let me just uh, point everybody to the agenda, which is public, and the, the various uh, rules and regulations that are now for consideration. I'm going to briefly summarize and, uh, and then open it for some discussion. Uh, questions of Tim, if anybody has that. Um, basically, the, the first set are some amendments to the current rules and regulations uh, dealing with tenure, uh, rules governing application for tenure, the dismissal for cause, academic grievance, uh, and discrimination grievance procedure for students, and also some new uh, rules and regs that would, uh, would be an equity resolution process for faculty members and an equity resolution process for staff members. Um, and uh, I won't go through the numbers, but uh, those are further refinements to, and, and in some respects, new processes that uh, all the campuses would be abiding by. Um, and importantly, uh, the new ones uh, specify that we would continue to give President Wolf uh, authority to, between now and two years from now, to revisit and to make changes subject to our subsequent ratification. Um, some of these are, are a little controversial. I, I would say that if you tried right now to go through uh, they touch on different chapters of the CRRs, and it would be difficult to really comprehend without spending a lot of time reading it. Uh, it's my hope that once adopted that we will have some very simple 
uh, handouts that will make uh, the faculty process clear to the faculty, uh, the staff process clear, which is a bit different, um, and uh, the student process, which uh, probably uh, is, is pretty vague to the students currently because the, the CRRs are so thick. Uh, so before we put a motion on the floor, let me say uh, I think some discussion of this, particularly the sensitive issue that Tim has, uh, has uh, focused us on, where we do know that there are faculty who, uh, who feel that uh, they're giving up some rights. Uh, I think that that deserves comment and uh, questions from the board, so I'm opening that up for discussion before we put it on motion. And David Steelman. <laughs> no, I'm okay, you're you're still there. All right, you're 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 exercising your back. We almost got by without him. <laughs> <laughs> Comments from anyone or questions? I have uh, I have a few myself, but I, I I'm going to exercise. The, chair's, uh, the chair of the HR committee's prerogative of not going first. Like Texas showdown, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we're mostly lawyers. Are we all lawyers uh, at the moment? That's, <clears throat> that's both a compliment and... It, I'm not. Well, <laughs> you those. didn't really need to bring but, that up. <laughs> on, on the board. <laughs> I know that's, that's a compliment or a criticism, depending on your point of view. Uh, but, uh, you know, we all have some thoughts and expertise. Uh, I think we're all supportive of the rule of law. And we're all supportive of uh, justice and the adversarial system, which is in the courts. Um, and uh, I think most of us are old enough that that's the only thing we were taught in law school. We weren't taught to mediate compromise or to have alternative processes, to have uh, attorneys representing clients in court. Uh, but it's near and dear to most attorneys, and uh, uh, it, it is a difficult question when you get in particularly to students' rights uh, and uh, whether, whether they would be reporting incidents if they knew that they would be under cross-examination by a skilled attorney as part of a process to have their grievances resolved. Uh, so my personal view for those that are present, I know we have uh, some of the faculty here today that have expressed their opinion. Several people, I'd say uh, a number of faculty have expressed reservations about it. Um, that I think it's a close question and that good questions have been raised. I'm personally convinced by the collaborative process that this university has gone through uh, in taking those views into account and having heard those and faculty members who may feel that they're giving up the right of uh, counsel and to cross-examine the accuser through counsel um, that that's been taken into consideration uh, by people who are their peers and uh, that we have, uh, you know, shared governance and faculty senates and uh, that, uh, that are designed to bring to consensus. Uh, and I think that that's occurred in this process. So uh, I'm expressing my own feeling that I have comfort uh, in the deliberation that has occurred. And uh, so I'm in favor of these uh, as a whole. Uh, also mindful that a year or two from now there may be processes that other universities have followed that may, may be superior in the, in the, uh, in the hearing. Uh, so uh, I think I also would have to say that the consultant that we've used and uh, uh, Daniel Swinton is the, the person that we've seen most often. Been very impressed by him, and my background is partly in employment, which deals with these issues, and, and uh, I, I think we've gotten wise counsel from him and his group. So uh, 
close question. Um, appreciate uh, the faculty being able to speak their piece throughout that process. And uh, um, that's, that's my individual thought. Now, all the rest of the lawyers around the table may, may v differ on that, um, but I, I welcome that to uh, think discussion is healthy. I move approval. I move approval of the uh, new set of rules, proposed rules that cool. govern complaints of sexual harassment and uh, other forms of discrimination. I second that. Is there any further discussion? I would. I would like to say that I take much solace from the thorough explanation given uh, to the board with respect to the vetting process that occurred with respect to the, in fact, the faculty council on all campuses and that um, it's through the assurances that particularly um, in, in, in great detail about how thoroughly the issue was vetted that, that I feel comfortable approving. Any other discussion? Not? Cindy, would you call the roll? Curator Covington? Yes. Curator Cups? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Henriksen? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. All votes in favor. Now before we move on to the second item, <clears throat> I, I will take the prerogative as the chair to raise a few issues for further consideration by our consultant and by the uh, administration that has been uh, dealing with the issues of sexual violence on campus. We didn't, uh, so I'm gonna just briefly go over a few points that I think deserve further uh, consideration. Um, and I, I wanna do it publicly. I think this is further uh, emphasis that, uh, that this is a work in process and we have work yet to be done. Uh, the first is, uh, with respect to training, I think that we've done, and I commend the, the, all the campuses for the training that they've done. Uh, I'm not sure that it's been uniformly uh, provided to all students, uh, perhaps freshmen, uh, but uh, now that we have policies in place, I hope that uh, the administration and, and uh, President Wolf will rapidly put in place uh, lots of student training that will be thoroughly vetted and, and uniformly uh, excellent. Um, it's hard to, to overnight create really good programs when you don't have the policies in place. Uh, I think there is a program that MU has that's on video, but I'm not sure that it's available to the other campuses yet. So we have work to be done in that area. Uh, the second is the, the, the question that the faculty have had about the use of advisors in the process. I have a, a, a second uh, issue that I don't think is necessarily finalized and that is uh, the ability uh, particularly of students to be able to have um, someone to whom they can go to uh, decide what course they want to take rather than reading through the rules and regs or even a, a simple handout uh, because that can be a, a life-changing experience for victims uh, as well as those accused. Um, and I've said before uh, that there is an ombudsman role that might be possible but something more than finding your way to the mental health clinic uh, and asking for psychological assistance um, and that would require the university to have a broader non-mandatory reporters to whom uh, students could could go and seek advice so I'm raising that as a uh, as a consideration and finally some uh, electronic incident reporting system there are uh, turnkey systems available I understand the university is considering developing its own system. Uh, there's even uh, an iPhone watch 
that with an application you can uh, have an immediate report. Garmin has the same thing available and, and I think that instead of uh, that we ought to really be emphasizing uh, reporting and prevention of violent incidents and I would encourage the university to continue to look at the alternatives that are, that are available. Um, I think that the university has done A plus work um, and I ask that those three considerations uh, continue to be examined. I'm just taking the opportunity as the chair of the committee to speak my piece on that. All right. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, sir, I can just say one thing. I want to say I personally appreciate your effort. I know that you have been monitoring this and I've been quite confident in what the process has been because of your efforts and I am grateful. I know this is an area that you have experience in. Thank you. And I, I have to say I think the university has, uh, has this, this is uh, one thing that I'm really proud the University of Missouri has taken uh, very, very seriously. So I think we ought to all be proud of the university's leadership in this. Thank you, David. All right, the next one is, uh, I think, pretty easy, and that is uh, uh, the, just an amendment uh, to the CRRs at uh, 3.0, uh, 320.010 which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Policy to broaden the context of it. It's in our materials. Um, any questions about that? This will make it consistent with federal law. Is there a motion for approval? I saw David raise his hand. A second? Second. Cindy, would you call the roll? Curator Covington? Yes. Curator Cups? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Henriksen? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. All votes in favor. Thank you, John. Uh, next, we have the Audit Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Audit Committee today has two information items and only one action item. And John Burdick from um, our internal auditors will come forward and give us the quarterly report and the Ethics and Compliance Hotline annual report. Thank you very much. Today we've got four reports to cover for you. The four that are, we're going to recover are, are listed here. The first one is the HIPAA high-tech security assessment over at the health center. The second one is a departmental audit of OBGYN and the women's health department. The third one that I'll cover is listed fourth, their office of provost, and then I'll finish with the expenditure governance review, which is system expenditures across the system. So the first one is around the HIPAA high-tech security assessment, and this, is, this deals with federal standards to protecting electronic protected health information. We did this audit um, to review the policies and procedures and activities that were taking place uh, in, the health, in the health center uh, and took an eye towards if the federal government came in and did an audit of the policies and procedures, how would the, how would the operation stand up? So we have seven uh, <clears throat> comments here. They're all listed as medium. The first one is around an IT security risk assessment. There is a risk assessment that's been done. The last one was done in 2012, so our recommendation is to up that and keep that uh, current. The second item is around a, developing a governance structure to deal with policies and procedures. There's a few policies and procedures that we recommended be implemented. We're asking for a governance structure to be put in place to evaluate those changes that need to be made in monitoring of the policies going forward. The third item is around incident reporting. There's really two elements here. One is around formalizing when an incident occurs around the protection of the data to have the escalation of it in appropriate times. And the second one is to do a look back where an incident might occur to find out the root cause, what took place, how it might be remediated. The fourth one is around disaster recovery and business continuity processes to make some improvements in terms of a couple of gaps that we recommended in the actual um, policy, and then second of all, uh, testing of the plan to ensure 
that you can prove that the plan that you had in place would work. And that's just something that um, is good to be able to do when, when evaluated by the, by the um, federal audit. The fifth and the sixth one deal with integrity controls. There are good controls around protecting of data on laptops, mobile devices, uh, there are, we, we, we noticed that there would be an improvement around using encryption technology around some of the servers and the backup uh, databases that are in place. And the seventh one is around IT security logs. So when events occur, um, there, there's, there are things are logged and what we are asking the group to do is to have a more formal process of evaluating the logs. It's just a good control to make sure that uh, things that are happening in, in the system are being monitored appropriately. So that's that audit. We'll move to the second one, which is OBGYN, Women's Health Department at the hospital system. So this department has six divisions and about 25 faculty members with a budget of around $9 million. We had five recommendations here. The first one dealt with the yearly incentive calculation process. And the gist of the uh, comment is to work to clarify and simplify the calculation using data that is not manual where possible and to have definitions where decisions are discretionary and to communicate that, this is the key, to communicate that with clarity to the physicians so there is a greater level of alignment between the incentive compensation plan and the understanding and the actions of the physicians. I want to note that we did not see people that were paid inappropriately. This is about a process improvement so the physicians uh, can have a great understanding of how their actions align with the actual plan that's been put in place by the university. The second one is around communication within the department. Strategic plan is put in place, there are financial results, there are investments, and what we're asking the group to do is enhance its communication style on a regular basis as we interviewed the uh, faculty and the physicians, that they, there was a great desire to understand the link between the strategic plan of the department and the actual results on an ongoing basis. The third through the fifth items are typical items that we might see inside of a departmental audit. None of these are great concern for you. They're items that we ask them to look at. One is around um, review and approval and documentation around some expenditures. Of the expenditures that we tested there, none of them were inappropriate, but the level of documentation and the level of review and approval, review and approval could be improved. The fourth one was around the fiscal processes that take place in the department. We asked them to document them so as turnover happens, people can understand how to pick up and carry forward. And the fifth one was one we see from time to time around cash receipts and just making sure they have the right uh, policies and procedures in place. The third item was a, an audit of the Office of Provost at Missouri S&T. Dr. Robert Marley was hired in January or July of 2014, and we came in and did an audit um, a after that, or, you know, in the transition. We had four comments here. The first one really is around aligning the budget to where the actual expenditures are being made. So, simply stated, budget amount, actual expenditures, they got out of alignment over a period of time. And the, what we're asking is that the budget be reset to reflect where they're actually spending their money. So they then can accomplish the second item here, which is to improve their monitoring procedures and just measuring budget to actual, just routine maintenance and good program from a fiscal standpoint. The third one is around tracking of financial commitments. So the provost office gets um, requests for financial commitments. Some are funded, some are not funded. We're asking them to develop a tracking tool so that they can understand the history and the policy of uh, or the, the procedures they went through and what they funded, what they did not. And the last one is really around uh, cross-training their staff in their fiscal office to ensure that they can uh, have the appropriate segregation of duties and the appropriate uh, fiscal responsibilities. The last one is around expenditure governance review. And this is one in a series of audits that we've done over the last few years. What we did with this audit is we took all of the expenditures that come through various avenues uh, across the system they include purchase orders, non-purchase orders, purchasing cards, time and expense reimbursements, and, re and, and, pay and uh, expenditures through the show me shop. We used data analytic tools 
to gather the information so we could go out and understand where to do some additional interviews across the university around the governance of spend. So as it says up there, 1.3 billion in spend over the course of the year. We went to 19 different units and did over 50 interviews. Uh, again, this is in a series of things that we're doing. Two comments that came out of this one. The first one is around communication and awareness of the expenditure resources. So the communication part means when changes are made, how do you get that into the hands of the people that need to have that information? And the second part around awareness is it's complex, the policies and the procedures that need to be followed. Is there a way to simply put them in a single site so that the users can go to really follow the policies and the procedures? The second item here talks about, and the last item talks about monitoring um, of expenditures. That's a big deal at the university, just given the dollar amount of the spend. Um, we believe, and we continue to beat this drum, that it's important to continue to enhance the level of review and approval that's a great control within the university. When we put together the data analytic tool, we did so in a Tableau file. What that does is it just gives people an a, a, a way to kind of look at the information. We turn that over to procurement at the end of our audit. They will use that going forward. The last thing I'll say about this is we've been talking with Dr. Burnett's office and we're encouraged, very encouraged, you should know that, uh, by the uh, tone that is coming out of that group and the um, focus on aggregate review and approval and monitoring of expenditures and also at a tactical level. Those are two critical controls when it comes to evaluating and monitoring expenses. So we are encouraged by what we're seeing directionally on that. That concludes my comments around the internal audit. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Any questions? Thank you very much. Dr. Burnett will now tell us about the ethics and compliance hotline, I believe. Uh, members of the Board of Curators, in your packet is the annual report that's done each February uh, about the ethics and compliance hotline. Um, we do give you uh, data on which parts of the organization had the most calls to the ethics and compliance hotline in addition to the resolution of those. And I would just say that of all that we received last year, 129 reports, only 17 were pending at the end of the year. Um, those were just ones that probably came in late in the year. But I think, we, I think what I've found since coming to the University of Missouri is we work very closely with the departments, most notably MU Health, but all the campuses as well to get these addressed in a timely fashion and get them dealt with. And uh, so I, I feel very comfortable with the report. Um, we can certainly give you any specifics you would want on specific cases, but I think overall having an ethics and compliance hotline is a very sound way of having an opportunity for people who have potential issues that need to be addressed uh, come up from, out, from within the organization when you're talking about a $3 billion organization across the state of Missouri. So um, I, <clears throat> it certainly has grown in the number of uh, uh, reports that have come in, but that was in large part due to adding the healthcare system and intercollegiate athletics and a number of parts that weren't a, a, a part of the uh, reporting structure at the initial outset. So we'll see if this continues, but uh, I don't think there's anything alarming to report other than we've had you know, some things that we had to deal with over the years that I think many of you are aware of over this last year that we've had to deal with. So happy to take any questions. Any questions for Dr. Burnett? <clears throat> Okay, our action item is the engagement of our, end of, of our outside auditor for next year. So there's no slides for this. Uh, it's in your packet <coughs> under open audit 1-1. One uh, for one additional year, uh, the management is recommending that, we, uh, that you uh, agree to uh, hire KPMG to do the external audit of the books of the university for fiscal year 15, the year we're in right now. Um, as noted in the information, um, they've had this uh, since about 2006. We are going to go out to bid, and we've shared this with the chair of the audit committee, our plan, and with the president, um, and we will have a process to um, at least have this re-looked at in the marketplace uh, across uh, firms in Missouri and outside of Missouri uh, to uh, see about, the, we're spending about $900,000 a year doing this audit across our, our enterprise. So. 
Um, we're going to look at that. Uh, we expect some competition. And I think it's al always healthy to get these um, contracts that are approaching a million dollars for relook in the marketplace. And so we're recommending one additional year with KPMG, and we'll be talking with you more later this year about auditors for fiscal year 16 and beyond. I see on our um, proposal that the uh, fees for KPMG this year will be $825,537 plus expenses not to exceed $70,000. Right. That's how you're pressing up close to $900,000. Yeah. Right. And they are, their contract limits them to CPI, kind of like our Senate Bill 389. Hmm. So this one's going up 0.76. We, we rounded to the extra decimal place, which was good work on the controller's office part. So, Any other questions for Dr. Burnett? Can I have a motion to extend the contract of KPMG? So moved. Second. Cindy, please call the roll. Curator Covington? Yes. Curator Cups? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Henriksen? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. All votes in favor. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the work of the audit committee for today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we go back into executive session now. Conclusion, we will reconvene tomorrow morning at uh, 9 a.m.